today, so we're going to jump right into it and leave time for questions at the end. I'm Mary Lou Ford, the director of the consortium, and we'll be going over um, the agenda. So today we're going to talk about the activities that we had from 2014 for those that missed the presentation at our conference, just to give you some of the highlights of our activities. We have Susan Huggins, who's here today from Open College at Kaplan University, and she's going to talk about the op open portfolio that they've developed. We'll have a report out on the open MOOC pilot that we've been doing this year, an update on the Open Education Information Center. We'll also talk about the global implementation strategy for OER that's happening. And I'll give you some highlights from the conference this year and where you can find more information in case you missed some of the presentations, and then leave time for your questions and comments. If at any time you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make, we invite you to please ask questions, jump in, type in the chat window, uh, raise your hand, and we'll be happy to, um, to stop and talk a little bit about whatever questions you have. So to start off, we wanted to go over the highlights of some of our activities from 2014. One of the big activities we had at the beginning of last year was uh, an exchange program with the U.S. State Department in cooperation with the Arab League and Alexo. And we had 15 professionals from across the Middle East um, and North Africa region come to the U.S. for three weeks to learn about OER and open education and to visit various universities in Boston, San Francisco area, Washington, D.C., and, um, and then have internships and placements at various universities for a full immersive experience. This program was really successful. Um, we had generated incredible interest. Every single person who was in this program has gone home and done something in their home country, one of which is another project we've been deeply involved with. This is the National E-Learning Center in Saudi Arabia, and they have started a big project on open education, one component of which is to train their female uh, faculty members on e-learning and open pedagogies. And so we've been involved in designing and delivering this program since February, and it will continue through December. We also launched the Open Education Professional Directory last year. Hopefully you're all listed in it and have been able to use it for um, your various needs. The Open Education Professional Directory has almost 300 entries right now. Um, and we will be continuing to refine and to work on this to make it useful for everyone this year. We also had a great program with the Organization of American States uh, and Virtual Educa in combining together to, to help support a portal where educators in Latin America can come together and find Spanish language resources to support their learning. And we've been taking up the open component of that. And Marcelo Morales has been working quite hard on it this year and is pretty excited about the launch of the, the portal that will take place very soon. We also had a really successful Open Education Week, thanks to many of you who participated. We found that the level of engagement this year in Open Education Week was very high, that we were successfully able to reach over into communities that haven't participated in the past, that we had well over 100 uh, different universities participating online, and then other universities participating uh, through local events, that some of which we didn't even know about until after the fact. But we found that this is now um, an event that people are planning calendars around and that have, has been fully incorporated into outreach efforts. So we want to thank you all for that. As one indicator, we uh, found some really interesting Twitter activity, which reached nearly 2 million people through the networks in just the four days of the, the first four days of Open Education Week. We also moved our search function uh, over to Merlot so that we could combine efforts and make exposure to OER even greater. So Merlot is now working with us on the search, um, which allows people to find materials more readily and to find more extensive materials. And then one of the other activities we wanted to highlight was a special collection we've been working on. We've taken Marshall McLuhan's digital materials and working with his daughter to make the transcript of his digital resources open uh, and to make sure that they're available to everyone. So the Marshall McLuhan Speaks special collection is just about ready to be launched. It will be launched in another week or so. Uh, and, and educators can take 
words right from him and, and incorporated into their education. So we hope to be able to continue to work on different special collections this year. One of the slides that I realized uh, did not get included in this, but I did want to mention is the outcome of our elections this year. We have a new board member, Stavros, from FGV in Brazil, who has joined the board. Um, Murilo from UNICEL, also in Brazil. Unfortunately, his term was up, and so he left the board. And we have a new board president, James Lapa Grosskleid is the president of the board, and Larry Cooperman is remaining on as the past president of the board, so we have the benefit of both of, both of their uh, support. Next, I wanted to invite Susan to talk about the open portfolio at, um, at Open College at Kaplan. Susan, do you want to take the microphone? Uh, Susan, you need to click on the um, talk button in order for us to hear you. All righty. Now can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. We are really excited to launch this Open Portfolio product. Um, can I? Yes, thank you so much. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide as well. The open portfolio is a concept that we came up with, I guess, maybe about 24 months ago. It is a product that we developed actually in-house that helps learners track and manage their open courses, which we think this is a, a great tool in the open world. Uh, you can access it uh, at the link that's provided in, uh, in the slide right here. You see, off to the left, you'll see Maximize Your OE OEC Experience with Open Portfolio. You just simply click on the link and you are directed directly to the portfolio. Uh, what is very unique about the portfolio, um, not only is it free and open to anyone, but you can also, as a learner, create multiple learning plans. You can create it by topic. You can self-organize it. It can be professional topics, topics of interest, or maybe even topics you know, that are discipline related, uh, such as you know, top topics in higher ed to help you prepare or strengthen your academic skills. We also have a series of what is called suggested learning plans. And these are learning plans that are pre-populated. Uh, we have faculty that will go through here and make some recommendations about uh, various courses that together will make up um, a particular learning plan, such as business management is one that's, that's huge, uh, that has the most uh, users in those particular topics. We also have health management, entrepreneurship, humanities, and information systems. Um, if anyone would like to see a particular learning plan with particular courses, you're welcome to send them directly to me and I'll get them created for you if there's a certain uh, grouping that you use the most. Um, right now, this is made up of uh, it's a collaboration between us and Open Education Consortium. So right now, the courses contained in the Open Portfolio um, come from uh, open ed courses that are listed on OEC website. The, this slide I uh, just wanted to show you right quickly is uh, really the robust of the word search here in the Open Learning Portfolio. If you just simply uh, enter a keyword in the keyword area, click search, it will search by title, keywords in the description, etc. We also have an advanced search where you can isolate it by institution, by language, or even by category. And again, if there's categories that we can help you with uh, that you would see a little bit more defined, please reach out to me and we'll work um, and see if we can get it, get it added for you. And the last slide, um, another aspect of the open portfolio that we thought was very useful to uh, the learners is to see who else was in the particular courses. We have the ability uh, on the little drop down and inside of each course you'll see a little drop down that says learners. And you can select the little drop down to see who else may be studying that particular course. 
um, you can uh, message back and forth within the community, within the open portfolio, without having to go outside and you know fill up other mailboxes, so to speak. Um, but you can see who else is in the courses. We have many other features um, in the open portfolio. Oh, I'm sorry. There's actually one more slide. Um, under the About Us tab in the open portfolio, we are soliciting feedback. And we would love your honest feedback. And we would love users to get in here and uh, show, share with us how they're using it, where they're using it, and if they find it beneficial. Um, this is a product that we are testing with the Open Education Consortium. And, uh, and we would love your feedback. So complete the survey. It's only about six questions. And uh, give us your honest feedback. We'd love to make this uh, a tool that we all can use and help, help us manage our open learning. Uh, if you have any questions, my email is on the last slide as well as um, our Twitter handle at Open College at KU. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I really, really look forward to everyone's comments. Great. Thanks, Susan. Do we have any questions for Susan right now? We'll also have an opportunity at the end of the meeting. And if I can follow up, we also have, we'll be sponsoring a webinar on uh, July 15th. Uh, so stand by for an announcement and more information on the webinar. We'll be actually giving uh, a detailed demo inside the Open Portfolio so you can see uh, more in depth of how it works. I do see a question. Do we want to address these now, or shall we just say at the very end? I'll just go ahead and address the ones right now, and then if there are more at the end, we can take them then. But I think um, if people have questions specifically to your presentation, best to do that now. Yeah, absolutely. There's one from Amy. She was just uh, asking about course content. That's something you would work out with OEC um, by loading your courses to the OEC website. Uh, because we're just pulling directly from there. We're not dealing uh, with content in the open portfolio, per se. We're using the content that's already on OEC. And yes, there is, uh, there are ways for faculty to contribute. And James, I couldn't agree more. I think in this world um, right now, uh, let me read the question. Uh, James just made a comment. I would say that this portfolio tool is very timely and will fulfill a need for learners. And we were thinking along the same pathway is that you know, in the open, open world, per se, there is no way to really track and manage all the open learning. And you know, if you're like me, I've got lists here and lists there, uh, but no collective way to bring it all together. So um, we think this is step one of a particularly you know, project that could be very beneficial to open learners. So again, I'm very interested in your in your feedback. You are welcome, Amy. And uh, if that's all the questions, you you have my email. Please feel free to reach out to me. I uh, really really look forward to your feedback. Great, thanks, Susan. We're really um, interested also to see what people do with this and uh, how we can improve it and uh, make it easier for people to collect and, and eventually assess their learning. Yes. Great. So we'll move on then to a report out uh, on the open MOOC pilot that we've been doing. And I wanted to throw up a slide that we put up here last year in our first quarterly membership meeting, uh, almost exactly a year ago, on why we were doing this. Why did we think that open MOOCs was a good idea? Uh, one of the things we thought at the time was that our members were really interested in doing MOOCs but didn't have the opportunity um, to participate in the current offerings or wanted to perhaps cast it out before committing fully. We also um, thought there was a real need to leverage existing OER and to put it in a way that it could benefit from the interactions and the opportunities that presented in a MOOC platform and to make them really uh, a fully open MOOC, so open enrollment as well as open content. Uh, we decided to go with edX because they were using open source software and they were also aligned with the ideals that we have as a, as a community. So to update you on what we've done then, in the past year we ran a pilot with eight 
courses from universities around the world. So we were able to do this in multiple languages. We worked with the National Chatham University in Taiwan, uh, Hokkaido University in Japan, and Arundel Community College in the U.S., Tufts University in the U.S., the TESS India Teacher Education Program in India, which is um, a collaboration between Indian universities and uh, the Open University of the UK, and the Polytechnic University of Madrid. So you can see from this screenshot that several of those courses are either starting really soon or are actually going on right now. Uh, the pilot phase actually took longer to develop the MOOCs than we had initially anticipated. So many of those MOOCs have started since uh, March of this year and going on through early fall. We decided to survey those who had participated in the, the pilot and to figure out what it took for them to actually make MOOCs out of their OER. One of the criteria that we had for doing an open MOOC was that it be based on existing open educational materials. And so we asked them first about the time commitment, and we found that the time commitment is quite significant. That they reported um, that it took a lot of time for instructional designers, for faculty, and for course facilitators. For those that didn't redo the video parts of their OER courses for the MOOCs, it only took about 10 to 20 hours of, uh, of editing their videos to get them ready. But for those who decided to go with new videos, they spent well over 100 hours shooting and editing new videos for the MOOCs. And these MOOCs are generally fairly short. The average length is probably four to five weeks long. So this is not a full 15-week semester course. Uh, project managers who just oversaw the process and kept things moving on the campuses averaged about 10 hours of work, as did the higher level administrators. We asked about their reuse of OER, and it really varied from institution to institution. The, the reported use of OER was uh, between 25 and 100 percent new content that had to be made. And when we look at the 100 percent new content that had to be made, what that really meant is that they took the existing OER materials and basically remade the videos um, to make them more MOOC friendly because the videos that they had were primarily classroom shots and other things that weren't as useful in the MOOC setting. What we found was that lower cost of making the new MOOCs was correlated to reusing OER, and that's one of the things we had thought at the beginning. Um, we'll see costs in just a second. That the new content, again, was primarily new video made specifically for edX's requirements and the MOOC platform, and that everybody had to create at least some new content. It wasn't possible to just use what was existing because edX has particular requirements that had to be met, and that was primarily new content specific to the edX platform. We asked them about the cost in dollars, and it depended on the extent of the modification of the materials that they had. Um, the range was about 6,500 U.S. dollars for a university that we used much of their OER content to well over $100,000 for a university that reshot all of their video and created most of the material based on their OER but redid it entirely for the edX platform. This is inclusive of staff time and other resources, um, but obviously the extensive video work was the most expensive. And one of the things that we have found is that um, as the edX MOOC platform evolves and the requirements change, that the, the increase in requirements is uh, directly related to an increase in time and cost for the university making the MOOC. There's also, of course, impact on the consortium itself. And one of the things that we have found is that the format of the existing OER has a big impact on how well it incorporates into edX. So different formats sometimes are harder to incorporate into edX, and we have to work a lot more with the university um, to get it correctly uh, rendered for the MOOC platform. That the overall process is quite involved, and because it's evolving, it requires a lot of um, communication and a lot of time back and forth. We were a bit surprised by the amount of time it actually required for the OEC staff. Just for the basic level communication, this didn't include reviewing the courses or any course design or even troubleshooting um, the platform itself, that we spent at least 40 hours per MOOC just discussing with edX and with the university on how, um, how this would evolve. 
One of the things that we have concluded from our pilot is that uh, we do think that the open MOOCs are a really valuable contribution, but that in terms of our organization, we won't be able to continue to offer them um, for no cost to our members because we have to at least cover our staff time. So one of the things that we are grappling with right now is the right way to do this. If we want to have a membership that would include MOOC support, which would be at a different membership level and a different membership due structure, or if we would want to have some type of a, a fee that would be associated with offering a MOOC through OEX, OECX. Uh, and we would really love to hear your comments on this and how we can support the open MOOC movement, but also make sure that it has a positive impact on the organization. So if anyone has comments on that now, we'd be really happy to hear that, or again, we can discuss at the end. Hi, Mary, this is Steve Carson. Um, I, I would think you might be able to do both, is to offer a membership level uh, that includes the MOOCs and also maybe offer an a la carte option. Uh, I also had a question that you uh, might see in the chat window there, which is how much of the format adjustments that had to be made were related to policies from the edX group side, and how much of them are related to technical requirements of the platform? Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I, I should have mentioned earlier that I have a very strange thing happening with um, with Collaborate, Blackboard Collaborate platform, and the chat window gets so tiny I can't actually see it. So if you do type something in the chat window that you want me to respond to, please um, signal me so that I can figure out how to read it. Um, so yeah, so getting to your question, Steve, um, a lot of the modifications were actually uh, based on the requirement, the changing requirements of edX. Um, certainly we found that some of the video, for example, that was shot in the classroom was harder to chop up into the small segments that the platform uh, works best with, but that it really was about um, the requirements of edX to have captioning and to have transcripts that go along with the videos um, that required quite a bit of additional work and, uh, and editing and reshooting on the part of our members. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, we're working with uh, EdCast, so we have an install of Open edX set up for ourselves. Um, but if anybody is looking for a captioning service, we use a, a service called 3Play, which is actually relatively affordable. Uh, if anybody wants any more information on that, I'm happy to provide. Great, thanks. Any other comments or questions on the uh, open MOOC pilot? All right, we'll continue along with the rest of the agenda. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was the Open Education Information Center that we've talked about in previous meetings, and Nina was going to give us an update on that. Hello? Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Yep, we can hear uh, you. Sorry. Okay, so the Open Education Information Center is now live on the Consortium website. On the top menu bar, you can go to Resources, and you'll see the menu for the Information Center. Now, the purpose of the Information Center is to offer a place where people can come and find all sorts of information on open education. And there are three things that the Information Center offers. Um, it offers information on open education, a calendar of events related to open education, and a discussion forum. Let me show you what it looks like. So the Open Education Information Center has inf information on open education organized for five different stakeholder groups. That they are faculty, students, administrator, policymaker, and researchers. And you can see the submit information, submit info button where anybody from the community can submit the kind of the, the information that they have.
Now, I'm going to choose a topic from the faculty section, which is technological concerns. When you go into that page, There you go. When you go into the page for technological concerns, you'll see that information is organized in the format of questions and answers. And at the bottom of each page, you will see a button that says join discussion or start a discussion. So after reading questions and answers on a certain topic, you can either start a discussion with other people or you can join the conversation that's already there. Now, unfortunately, we, have, we found a bit of glitch in the function earlier today, so we hit it for now. But in a couple of days, it'll be live again. So this um, initiative is still a work in progress. We'll be inviting the community to contribute content. And more contents are being uploaded as we speak. Now, so that's all for me as it's probably much better for you to browse through the pages rather than to hear somebody talk about it. So please go to the consortium website, visit the Information Center, let us know what you think, and we'll have the forum function up there very soon so that we can all talk about stuff. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mina. As uh, Mina said, one of the motivations that we had for doing this was that we found that the interest in open education has become much more nuanced and sophisticated over the past several years. And for one thing, there's not much room for people who are rather experienced with open education to really collaborate, ask questions of each other, and find out more information about what people are doing. So we tried to organize this Open Education Information Center by role rather than by topic so that you can go in and find the information you need um, for the purpose that you're looking for. And we do appreciate any comments and feedback. So this is the beta version. Uh, it's being launched now uh, for feedback and comments. And we'll be consistently improving this over the next few months so that we can have a full hard launch um, by the time the new school year starts in uh, Europe and the US. So the other thing we wanted to talk about today was the global open education implementation strategy. <clears throat> We're not going to have time to get too far into the document, but it's also inviting your comments and your feedback. Um, this document will be sent out to the wide open education community uh, this week. We're planning to send it out on Thursday. What happened was there was a group of um, OER professionals who got together in Washington, D.C. from around the world earlier this year to discuss the state of OER. Uh, globally and how we could advance it as a coordinated group. And so we got together and thought that there were several opportunities that we had. Um, those included demand for OER, the supply of OER, and the capacity of the movement as it stands. And we put together a document based on discussions that we had over a couple of days that talked about the areas where we commonly agree in general in the OER movement. This includes our values and the importance that we attach to OER for the future of education. And areas where we have divergent views, and that includes things like what's the next big priority? And is it more important to do this in higher education or K-12? We looked at overall strengths and challenges that the movement faced, and we summarized all of these up to form a snapshot of where we are in the global movement. So looking at where we are now, the opportunities that we have moving forward, we thought that it was a great opportunity to figure out where the opportunities are for collaboration to be able to implement OER worldwide. And that's the document that we have that we want your feedback on. It's about a four or five page document right now. There are a few of us that have been working on drafting the document based on wide conversations that we had both at that meeting and then a number of follow-up meetings held at various conferences around the world, including one in Banff. We want this document to be useful, like the Cape Town Declaration or the Paris Declaration, in really both um, stating what the movement is doing right now, but also in figuring out what we need to move forward. And we really want your feedback on that. This will be sent widely on Thursday, but if you'd like a 
pre-look at the document and like to get your comments in first, I've included the link um, to it there. It's tinyurl.com backslash OER implementation. Please take a look. Include your comments. If you have extensive comments or edits that you'd like to make, you can send to any of us on the drafting committee and we'll be happy to incorporate that in. We're also happy to talk to you individually by Skype or by email if you have particular comments or concerns. So please do take a look at this and let's make this useful as possible for the movement. All right, so we also wanted to take just a few minutes and summarize the Open Education Global Conference that we had in Banff this year and to give you an opportunity to see where you can find out um, more information about the presentations you missed. So our conference was held in Banff um, just about a month and a half ago. Uh, it was a glorious location, very well coordinated, and everyone seemed quite pleased with being in Canada. We had fantastic international representation this year. We had 37 countries represented. These are the top 10 number of people, um, which included uh, Canada and the United States, which makes sense from a geog geography standpoint. But then the next number you see is from Saudi Arabia. And this we, we attribute to that project um, that we did with the U.S. State Department that we talked about earlier, but also the Netherlands, United Kingdom, South Africa, Slovenia, Taiwan, France, Indonesia, and Mexico rounded out the top ten. So you can see it was a really interesting mix uh, from around the world who all came to Canada. We had wonderful presentations, very good, very professional. We had a lot of comments about the level and the quality of the presentations this year. We were able to capture almost every presentation and we have put them up on the website. So if you'd like to visit the ones you weren't able to attend or if you missed BANF entirely, you can get a feel for what the conference was like. If you go to the uh, conference website, you'll see it under presentations and the links are right there highlighted in blue. You can also find selected presentations done with Open Praxis, our partner again this year. Uh, we were very thankful to have them do a special edition on selected conference presentations and papers, and they are available online at the Open Praxis site. And so we've come to the point in the discussion where we'd love to hear from you, your questions, your comments, your input, your feedback, or any um, projects that you're working on that you'd like everyone else to know about. So the floor is open. Um, Mary Lou, this is this is Una. I wanted to answer a question uh, that Buddy asked earlier. He asked what the average enrollment was for the OECX MOOCs. And um, it's interesting. Um, the average, <laughs> I would say, the average enrollment was about 3,000 for the MOOCs that we've run thus far. We've run about five or six now. Uh, there was one exception to that, which was the business MOOC from Anne Arundel. And that one actually, the enrollment was 13,000. So there's a couple of things there's a couple of things to be aware of. Number one, enrollment is not the same as retention. And um, only one of our um, developers at this point has actually looked at retention, and that's tough. University, which offered the biology of water, and they actually had a very high retention rate uh, for uh, their course, and they'll be offering that one again in July, and uh, they'll be offering a part two in September. Um, the thing with uh, the business course that was offered from Anne Arundel, um, you know, was actually a you know very good intro course. Um, but we know from um, some of the statistics that edX has shared with us is that, um, learners who come to the platform are looking for courses such as business and engineering. Those tend to be the top ones. So uh, courses like that do attract more attention. Um, so that's why the 13,000 I think is a little bit of an outlier. And uh, we don't have the retention numbers yet uh, from Anne Arundel, but we'll hopefully we'll be getting those. So on average, with that exception, they were running about 3,000 in enrollment. So I hope that answers your question. Hi, everyone. This is Susan. I wanted to uh, just jump in for a second and let everyone know 
Um, we have a, a Twitter event coming up in July. Um, it's specifically on July 27th. This is a follow-on to our original Twitter event that we did during Open Education Week where we attracted uh, well over 400 individual Twitters um, focused on the subject of open. Uh, it was called All About Open. Uh, in July, we'll be focusing on uh, alternative course providers, which uh, is us. Um, so we are actually sending out invitations. You can reach out uh, to our Twitter handle and find more information. But we're soliciting uh, participation. It will only be a four-hour event that day, uh, 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern or New York time. Uh, and we invite anyone and everyone to participate and become involved in discussing the open uh, alternative content providers. Great, thanks Susan. I don't know if people have participated in Twitch apps before, but they're they're really fast paced and interesting and I found some really inspirational stuff coming from that. So thanks Susan. We'll look forward to that. And Susan, do you want to share the hashtag handle? I would love to. Uh, it's hashtag all about open. Very simple. Okay, great. We'll put that in the uh, chat window. Fabulous, thank you. Yeah, and Mary Lou, I'll add on to that. Our first event was 24 hours, and it was very difficult to break away, even to take, take a nap. Uh, the invitees, the participants were so engaging. The discussion was um, uh, just beyond what I ever imagined it would be, and it was just very enlightening uh, to have that discussion in the virtual world, and I'm sure this one will be the same, but, but I agree with you. It was very inspirational. And since you brought up Open Education Week, you reminded me that we have um, a survey going on. We, we've heard from several people that, uh, that the timing of Open Education Week can be difficult. And while we probably won't be able to change the date that much for 2016, we do want to uh, look at dates that would be better for the overall community. So I just uh, put up in the chat window a link to a survey. And if you would take a couple minutes to let us know what would be the ideal time frame, the ideal month to hold Open Education Week from your perspective. Then we can look at that uh, on a global scale and come up with something that might work for everyone in the future. Any other comments, questions, activities that you'd like to highlight? Mary Lou? Yep, Larry, we can hear you. Great. Um, I just want to make an announcement that the um, that we've been working on our our, our own uh, open um, education platform for our for UCI's um, website uh, to manage open courses, uh, download in common cartridge format, various things like that that in the past were ful fulfilled for smaller organizations by, uh, what was the name of it again? Uh, it's, now, it's now sort of orphan software, uh, EduCommons. Um, uh, and so we're going to release it as open source, and it has we're we're putting in some last uh, feature sets to it right now. But um, one of the questions that's being raised in the Open Education Information Center is what how to choose the right platform. Uh, you know how can I make this easy on myself? So we're looking at the possibility that we both open raise. Um, release it as open source software so people can do whatever they want with it, but also that um, we could host um, for, uh, you know, a, a, as tiny a fee as possible um, an instance of it that would let people get going so there could be a free level uh, and then also some kind of premium support if people were interested in that. But I'd actually like to find out what the state is uh, for open education management software 
um, and whether people, particularly with new members, whether they're looking for something like this um, uh, that would so that it would actually fill a need, or whether we just, you know, as people lose entry comments, whether they just go on to Moodle or, or something that's that's cheap and easy for them. Great, thanks, Larry. Does anyone have any responses for Larry? All right, well, Larry, maybe we'll also um, invite you to, to speak at the next membership meeting and you can present more fully um, what you are working on and people can ask more questions then. Okay, I think uh, there was a question from uh, Sylvia about sharing the lessons learned from OECX and the next steps. Yes, Sylvia, we are going to repair, uh, prepare a report that we'll post on the website and let you know when that's ready, so that you can um, you can look at the lessons learned from running the open pilot, the open MOOC pilot based on OER. Anyone else have comments or activities that they'd like to share? Okay, we want to remind you that uh, next year our conference will be in Poland, in Krakow, in April, and the website will be ready by July 1st. The call for um, presentations will go out at the beginning of September, and that will need to be in by the middle of November so that we can get those uh, a program ready and, and shared with you by the start of the new year. So we want to thank you all for participating. We are, of course, um, happy to receive your feedback and your questions at any time. Feel free to contact us, any of the staff members, or you can write to feedback at oeconsortium.org and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Um, we appreciate your support of open education. We look forward to working with you in the future. And we thank you again for your participation. Uh, Mary Lou, um, Bunny asked if you could repeat the information about um, the conference next year. Yes, absolutely. The conference next year will be in Krakow, Poland in uh, the middle of April. The dates are the 14th through the 16th of April. And um, we will be putting out the call for proposals at the beginning of September. They'll be due by the middle of November. And the website will be up and available on July 1st. I also noticed that Agnes, who is the editor of Open Praxis, has joined us, so I wanted to acknowledge her and thank her for her support and uh, participation in, uh, in the special edition. Uh, we really appreciate having Open Praxis as a partner for the consortium and as an opportunity for people to have their papers peer-reviewed and published. So thank you, Agnes. <laughs>